The year is 1997. No doubt and Celine Dion are topping charts around the world. Radiohead have released their seminal record, OK Computer, and the Spice Girls and the Backstreet Boys are spearheading the re-emergence of pop music. And a certain Miss Janet Jackson is releasing her long-awaited sixth studio album, The Velvet Rope. Today, over two decades later, it is widely hailed as Miss Jackson's very best album, the crowning jewel in her long and illustrious body of work. But whilst it achieved respectable commercial success and was reasonably well received by critics, many, myself included, felt it never received the plaudits it deserved at the time, especially now considering the long-term influence it has had. Retrospectively, of course, the album is now considered a classic, Janet's magnum opus. In 2022, Pitchfork, the music blog, awarded the album 9.1 out of 10 in a retrospective review and named it as their seventh favourite album album of the 90s decade. Rolling Stone magazine included the record on their list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And incidentally, it is my favourite album ever. Experimental and deeply personal, it became a benchmark for coming-of-age albums and for pop stars who want to experiment with darker material. The album includes 16 superb songs about self-discovery, mental health and sexuality, which underpin an adventurous and exciting soundscape. It is now widely cited as having played a key role in the birth of alternative R&B. Its influence can be heard in the work of Rihanna, especially on her anti-album, FKA Twigs and SZA, among many others. I'm not going to talk about the record so much or its far-reaching impact, as there are already countless videos and think pieces on that. I want to talk about why it never got the praise it so richly deserved at the time. Now that it looks like the Velvet Rope is finally receiving its flowers, it seems like the perfect time to ask just why was this classic album so overlooked in the late 90s? Let's find out. Got Till It's Gone, the album's lead single was met with favourable reviews upon its release, but performed somewhat disappointingly on the charts, which may have impacted how the album was received at the time. In 1996, the year before the album's release, Janet had signed the biggest record contract ever at the time for a reported $80 million with Virgin Records. And nothing short of huge hits was expected from her, especially in the States, Janet's biggest market. Just to give you an idea of her standing at the time, the record-breaking deal dwarfed the $60 million contracts her brother Michael and Madonna had signed a few years earlier. Janet's eponymous last album had sold 16 million copies and its lead single, That's The Way Love Goes, was a straight out the box smash. It went to number one in the US for eight weeks and number two in the UK. It also reached number one in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hungary, South Africa and Japan. Upon its release, Got Till It's Gone only reached number 36 in the airplay chart stateside, before Virgin decided not to release a commercial single and instead focused their energy on the more pop-friendly Together Again. Considering Janet's superstar status and with the biggest record deal in history at the time, this was a cause for concern. Jimmy Jam in an interview on The Clay Kane Show talked about why the song hadn't worked out in the way he had hoped in America. Back in the day when black artists had to cross over to the pop charts, Janet was very adept at doing that. We were all aware that she had two audiences, and when Got Till It's Gone came out, out of the three Janet albums we did, The Velvet Rope was the fourth. This was the first time with black radio it was number one for weeks, but pop radio said, we'll wait till the next one. The video was a beautiful video, but I think if it had been a shiny Janet video, the song would have got played on pop radio. But because it was challenging for those audiences, because it wasn't Janet dancing and all that, I don't think it worked for them. Interestingly, the second single, Together Again, was a number one pop record because it was the Janet people wanted to see. Whilst American pop radio didn't take to the song, the Grammys awarded Got Till It's Gone the best short form music video of 1998, and in my humble opinion, rightly so. The cinematography is superb, and the 60s and 70s Africana fashion looks so cool. Every frame is a stunning image in itself, and there was substance to back up the style, as the video was set in South Africa during the apartheid, with Janet playing a lounge singer. Not having a big lead-off single from a major pop album probably meant that some critics did not give it the support it deserved. 
and it almost certainly negatively impacted on the general buzz and excitement around the record. And the somewhat disappointing performance of Got Till It's Gone more than likely impacted sales of the album in those crucial first few weeks, even though The Velvet Rope went on to sell 8 million copies. In an interview with Janet in early 98, the Washington Post wrote about the album's performance. Virgin Records isn't seeing the sales the label envisioned when it signed Jackson to that $80 million contract. The Velvet Rope did open at number one and has sold 2 million copies, but spent only three weeks in the top 10. Its predecessor, Janet, spent six weeks atop the charts and eight months in the top 10, on the way to sales of 5 million. At the time of writing, Got Till It's Gone has now had over 75 million streams on Spotify, making it one of Janet's biggest hits on the platform, which I think is fair to say is a strong indicator that the song was indeed ahead of its time. Three of the most dominant themes on the album, mental health, sexuality and LGBTQ plus positivity, were all pretty taboo subjects in the late 90s. And these were the areas the media focused on when writing and reporting on the record. The album was even banned in Singapore because of its sexual lyrics. Janet was very open in interviews at the time about her struggle with her mental health, and how most of the album had been inspired by those experiences. The dialogue which exists in our wider culture today about mental health absolutely did not exist back then, maybe with the exception of the occasional Oprah episode. There have been great socio-cultural shifts in the years since, and whilst there is still stigma attached to mental health issues, it's nothing compared to what it was like in the 90s. And the media at the time when talking about the album focused heavily on the sex theme tracks, which were really only three or four of the album songs. Whilst the Janet album was seen for the most part as a young woman's sexual awakening, the Velvet Rope was portrayed as pushing the envelope further, especially with its ode to mild S&M, Rope Burn. Bear in mind this was just a few short years after Madonna's Erotica and Sex Book, and a year before Sex and the City debuted on our TV screens. Women being sex positive publicly was still very much a social taboo. It clearly wasn't as big of a deal 13 years later when a major mainstream pop star like Rihanna released a single entitled S&M. Miss Jackson definitely walked so Riri could run. A quote from a Rolling Stone interview with Janet from 98 summed up the general reception the album had received at the time. Her metaphors were misunderstood. The word was she was into bondage or she was depressed. They said the album wasn't selling. They said the tour was bombing. The press was hostile and for the first time in Janet's career, downright mean. Another article from the Washington Post from the same year also gave an important insight into how the album was received. Some critics have dismissed The Velvet Rope as an overtly sexual, at times ambiguous, effort at adult credibility. There'd been no fuss a few years back when Jackson appeared on the cover of Rolling Stone, wearing nothing but a human hand bustier. But the album's intimations of bondage unsettled folks, as did a cover of Rod Stewart's Deflower the Virgin saga, Tonight's the Night, which Jackson recorded with the female references intact, fueling rumours of bisexuality or lesbianism. Whilst LGBTQ plus culture has now become much more mainstream, and it's commonplace for high profile figures to be supportive of the community and its issues, it was a very different story back in the 90s. George Michael hadn't come out until 98, Will and Grace debuted the same year, and Friends was considered groundbreaking for featuring a gay wedding of two minor characters in 96. Ellen came out publicly on her sitcom in 97, which attracted widespread public attention, but the show was cancelled the following year. Representation of gay people in popular culture was limited, and not always positive. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey in 1997, Janet spoke about how on the velvet rope she was determined to do things her way. I always did things for other people in the past. Whether this is a great idea for this, or this will help sell more records, or this won't sell more records. This album is about me. And then there were other reasons. Unlike today, pop was a seriously dirty word back in the 90s. Back then there was a very clear divide between those who were quote unquote serious musicians and those who were seen as pop stars. 
those who might not write their own songs or were seen as coming from performing backgrounds. For example, Madge was nearly two decades into her career before she won a Grammy for her music in 99. Although Janet had received many Grammy nominations for Control and for Rhythm Nation, accusations that Janet was just a producer's act persisted over the years. Anyone familiar with Janet's work notes that she has a writing credit on almost all of her material and plays an integral part in the writing of her songs. And the bulk of Jam and Lewis's success has been achieved with Janet. Of their 16 US number ones, 10 have been with Miss Jackson. The Velvet Rope did very well selling over 8 million copies worldwide, but it wasn't a chart blockbuster in the way that Janet's last three albums had been in the US. And with the shadow of the biggest recording contract in history looming over her, anything short of a spectacular success was seen by some as a sort of failure, which might explain why the Grammys didn't pay the album the attention many feel it should have. Albums by other female artists at the time, such as Madonna's Ray of Light and Lauren Hill's Miseducation Of, released a year after The Velvet Rope, were universally praised by critics and went on to win numerous Grammys in 99. Award committees such as the Grammys are usually made up of middle-aged men who tend to favour more rock and folk and singer songwritery style music. And many have pointed to their failure to recognise certain genres and artists in the main categories over the years. The problem became glaringly apparent many years later at the 2017 Grammys when Beyonce's hotly tipped Lemonade, which had achieved huge cultural impact and received glowing reviews from critics and fans alike, failed to pick up Album of the Year, with the award instead going to Adele's 25. I don't want to talk too much about this subject as it's not my story to tell and you would need a much longer video to adequately address this issue. But it could be one reason why, for the most part, the Grammys, with the exception of its nomination for I Get Lonely in an R&B category, failed to recognise the music of The Velvet Rope in 98-99. Sometimes when artists' projects, be it books, movies or albums, don't receive the plaudits some feel they deserve, said artist often defends their work by claiming it was simply ahead of its time, which can often be interpreted as an excuse to save face or even arrogance. But for The Velvet Rope, taking into account the enormous impact it's had on so many modern day artists, the high esteem it is held in by so many and its enduring popularity, it looks like The Velvet Rope was one record that truly was ahead of its time. Was met with favourable reviews upon its release, performed ugh, and it almost certainly negatively ugh. and whilst there is still stigma attached to mental health, this was a con cause for a concern. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you have any thoughts on anything in this video, please leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my other videos.